Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you all today to have another wonderful first day of the week on which to celebrate our risen King, our Lord, our Savior. We uh, are glad to have this opportunity. We take special time this day to uh, take of the Lord's Supper. Many of you might be doing that right now. Many of you might be doing that later on today, as we will be. Um, at any rate, it's a wonderful day, and it's wonderful because we have such wonderful things to celebrate, um, and a wonderful God who makes it wonderful. Um, so, part of what our wonderful God has done for us is given us the Bible, and it's been our pattern in uh, our secondary service, and because we've switched things around, that's our morning now. Um, it's become our practice to continue our, our series, our study on First John, uh, by sermon on um, on a live video. So that's what this is. So I thank you for tuning in if you're able. Um, and I'll be picking up in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. That's where we left off. We finished chapter 3 last time. I believe that was two weeks ago. And so we'll be picking up in chapter 4 today. So let's go ahead and read chapter 4 verses 1 through 6 together as we get into this study of God's Word. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version if you'd like to follow along. John writes, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. A lot of really cool things happening in this passage. And before we get into them, and we'll go back through this kind of verse by verse and pick apart a couple things to help deepen our understanding of what God is conveying to us in his word. Uh, but a couple of things that we want to recall from the context in 1 John, this text certainly does not appear in a vacuum. Uh, no text in the Bible does indeed. And so we kind of might do well to jog our memory and remember that especially throughout chapters 2 and 3, he's been talking a lot about truth and error. The fact that there are people who are coming to deceive Christians, and that's still a very prevalent thing that we need to be on guard against in it. Um, and watching out for. We need to be vigilant about that because it's a very active thing that's going on and it has been going on since the time of, at least the time of John's writing. And so uh, he's, he's set up this dynamic where he's conveying to them, first of all, that there are people out to watch you, to test you, to tempt you, to lead you away from the truth. These are deceiving spirits. He calls them a couple of times in this book. In fact, this is the book of the Bible that uses the word Antichrist the most. And so, and I think the only other one is Second John. I don't think the word Antichrist appears outside of John's writings. If memory serves, I, I can be wrong on that. The point that I'm making is that he's writing about things that are very much still a concern, are very much still a problem for us today. And with these warnings, however, that he tells them, watch out, these people are coming among you. He also tells them, you have been given everything that you need to overcome. In his encouragement to fathers, to old men, to, uh, to fathers, to young men, and to children in chapter 2, he talks about how he, part of his encouragement to them is that you have overcome the world. Take heart, you have overcome the world. And then later he talks about the anointing that we have. In chapter 2 also, uh, King in about verse 27, uh, well, we'll pick up in 26 and read um, through 27. He says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him, that is from God, abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, 
abide in him. So we have the tools, we have the mechanisms, we have every good thing that we need from the Father of Lights. We have everything that we need to dispel the darkness of truth, uh, the darkness of evil and deceit and to pursue truth and to let truth conquer. And a lot of us, and we talked about this in our sermon on this passage, a lot of us might feel like we're inadequate to stand up against error, against false teaching. But he says, no, the anointing that you've received, and maybe he's referring to the miraculous spiritual gifts that have since ceased. Maybe he's talking about miraculous gifts of knowledge, miraculous gifts of faith, and things like that that would have emboldened them and made them able where otherwise they would not have been. That could have been part of the quote-unquote anointing that he's talking about. But I prefer to think that it's something that still is applicable today. We know that still when we are put into Christ through immersion, through baptism in water, that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, not gifts of the Holy Spirit, not miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, but the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he dwells in us. That is our anointing. That is what marks us and sets us apart. And because of that, because that is what is in us, because the word is what is in us and living in us and dwelling in us, then we have the ability, we have the strength, we have enough truth and knowledge of the truth and understanding of the truth, or we can if we're diligent about it, to refute error. That is our mission. And so I wanted to start off with that bit of background. It's been kind of a long introduction here, but I want us to start out with that bit of background as we go into today's lesson. So coming back then to chapter 4 and verse 1 where we're picking up, not forgetting that a lot of what he's been talking about is a result of this anointing that we have and this ability that we have to prefer truth, to recognize truth, to follow truth, and to present truth, to live that out, is that we will love one another and not be hateful. Right? That's the dichotomy that he sets up throughout the book and that he follows that theme. There's this theme of light and dark and truth and error. And these are really what's prevalent in First John's letter or in John's first letter. So if we come back here now, finally, to chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, this is pretty key to understanding some of the things that he's going to say next. Um, And with that, we want to understand a couple things. So first of all, what does he mean by every spirit? Is he talking about whether it's demons or angels? Is he talking about um, ghosts and specters? Is he talking about just the, the airs, the attitudes, and, and maybe um, the, the general feel of somebody's teaching or the general teaching that somebody might bring? What is he talking about when he says, test every spirit? Um, and so we want to talk about that. But remember, the point of this is so that we can discern the truth. The point of this in its context is so that we can discern truth. So when we try to understand what he's saying, we want to keep the point of the text in mind. But also we're going to cheat a little bit and pick up something that he said there at the very, very end. If you caught it there in verse 6, he says at the very end of verse 6, By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So every spirit that comes around us, and I'm not talking about angels and demons and things like that. That's a completely different discussion and maybe has bearing on this um, in no small way, but that's not part of my discussion today. What I'd like us to think about is that there are essentially two spirits that are going to be present and we need to test, we need to discern what kind of spirit we're dealing with when we encounter any form of teaching. Okay, and so a couple of things that we want to look at is first of all the word spirit, which means uh, the Greek word we know is pneuma and that's Um, several times in the New Testament, about five times out of the more than 300, almost 380 times that the word pneuma is used in the New Testament, five of them, a whole five, it's translated as either breath or wind, right? I think it's two times for um, wind and three times for breath or the other way around. At any rate, what what we mean, and it's reminiscent of what James talks about by... By us being blown about by every wind of doctrine, right? So every pneuma of doctrine, every spirit of doctrine. And so it's not just the idea that there is a... It's not necessarily the idea so much that there is a a living entity in every teaching. That's a different discussion. But it's at least the fact that there is an idea that is carried out with a given doctrine... There's a, a, a wind of it. There's a, a breath of it. It has its characteristics. 
Okay, This doctrine will have its characteristics, and those will either be from God or not from God, as far as the language that he uses here in this particular um, section of Scripture. And so we need to test these things. And the word test is another interesting, and this won't be a whole lesson full of word studies. We'll just have a couple of them. But I think it's important to look at test um, because the, the Greek word means to examine, it means to approve, it means to put to the test or, or to scrutinize. Okay, And it's used throughout Scripture several times, and it's translated either as approve, interpret, examine, discern, see, accredit, or prove. Right. So I've thrown a bunch of words at you, but what do they mean? In this context, I, I want us to think about the idea of testing the spirits means that we need to scrutinize what we're hearing. When somebody brings us a teaching associated with the gospel, especially if somebody claims to be coming in the name of God telling us something, we need to discern whether they're speaking from the spirit of truth or the spirit of error, whether they are a prophet of God or a false prophet that is a mouthpiece of the living God or a false mouthpiece of the living God, right? And so this is very much still applicable and part of what we need to do every time that we hear somebody teaching the word in any sense or saying things about God in any sense, we need to be diligent and discern whether it is true or whether it is not true, okay? This is the responsibility that every person in every audience has Anytime that we are listening, we have this responsibility to test every spirit. Okay, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And again, making the point that this is because false prophets have gone out and are in the world, that kind of helps shape our understanding and our view of what these true spirits and false spirits, what these right spirits and evil spirits are right? And how we need to discern between the two. So now I feel like we're a little bit better prepared to look at verse two, which says something very interesting in my opinion. So it says, by this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And continuing into three, since it's the same sentence, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. So as we look there at the uh, at verse 2 and the beginning there of chapter 3, when it talks about spirits that are from God or are not from God, we can discern this based on whether they confess the name of Jesus. Now, if he is purely talking um, about confession with the lips, as we often talk about, and it's not wrong to talk about that, the, the mouth is the primary vehicle for confession. That is where we most often think about it, and that is not at all unbiblical. Romans 10 specifically states that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Christ and believe in your heart, right, that's unto salvation. And so we, we know that the mouth is directly associated with confession, and I'm not taking anything away from that. But I want us to, to realize and to recall that the Bible has a deeper understanding and a deeper message behind instructions to confess something. If I'm confessing something, then yes, it's going to come out of my mouth, but it's going to do more than that, isn't it? It's going to be part of the life that I live. My reputation will be a witness, if you will, will be a testimony, will be a confession of my faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? So it's, it's a, it's a life-filling thing to confess Jesus. It is something that is seen in every action and in every facet of our lives, whether or not we confess Jesus. Now, the reason I make so much clarification is because if we understand that it is just with the lips that one can confess Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then that means that that spirit is from God, then there's a glaring contradiction in Scripture. Okay, And we know that that cannot be so because it's written, from, it's written and delivered by a perfect God. Okay? The, the confusion that I see and the uh, 
contradiction that might exist if we understand confession with this limited view of just being saying these words. And uh, uh, somewhere it says that no one can say that Jesus is the Christ except by the Spirit of God. Okay, even then, similar similar thought, right? And here, so we need to understand that because there are at least three accounts in the Gospels. There are at least three unique instances where demons confessed Jesus. And this was their form of causing trouble. Sometimes they caused blindness. Sometimes they caused seizures and sickness. Sometimes they caused a multitude of other problems. They caused people to be completely um, lunatic. But sometimes all that they were doing was calling out Jesus as the Son of God. And I'll give you some, some verse references to look at. In Mark 1, verses 21 through 28, and that's paralleled in Luke 4, verses 31 through 37. So in Mark 1, 21, and Luke 4, 31, and the verses following, we have the story of the demon in the synagogue who, um, through the exchange that's going on, the demon says to Jesus... I know you are the Holy One of God. He's using lips to say that under directly demonic influence. Okay? That seems to not really line up with our 1 John 4 verse 2. Right? That every spirit who confesses Jesus is from God is... uh, That every tongue who confesses that Jesus is from God is from God. Um, Also in Matthew 8... 28 and following, as well as Luke 8, 26 and following, um, the story of Legion, which is also reflected in Mark 5, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And he says, Jesus, son of the most high God, what have you to do with us? Okay, so part of his address to Jesus is a confession that he is from God. And again, in Luke 4 and verse 41, we're simply told that sometime when Jesus was healing people, Demons. You know, Jesus was approached by demons who called out, You are the Son of God. That was the way that they were interfering with Jesus' ministry, was by declaring that you are the Son of God. Okay, so here we have these three unique instances, at the very least, these three unique instances that we can point to and see that demons, that is those who are definitely not of God, not from God, not representing God, were capable of, and made a point of using mouths, using tongues, using language, using breath, using wind, using air, using language, to confess Jesus as the Son of God. So how does that line up with 1 John 4 and verse 2, where he says, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Okay. Well... Sure, we can we can draw the line that God still has authority even over Satan and his armies, right? Satan and his angels of darkness, right? Um, which is absolutely true. Satan uh, Satan is absolutely under God's control and under God's dominion. Uh, he is subject to God's authority. That is, that's what I'm trying to say. And so his demons necessarily are also. That's why Jesus and the name, the power, the authority of Jesus is capable of evicting demons from their host. They are subject to the power of Jesus. They know this. They're able to confess this, but they're not capable of living it out and confessing. And that is having a a life that represents that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Their life is dedicated to destroying the purpose of Jesus being the Son of God and coming in the flesh and taking away the sins of the world. That is their purpose. And so their very existence, all of these evil and unclean spirits, their very existence is for the specific purpose of defying the Son of the Most High God. Okay, So while they are able to express who he is, they are able to say his name and connect it with the Father in the absolutely biblically appropriate way. They are not able to live a life confessing that. So then we also need to make sure that first of all, we are saying what we need to say. But also, we need to, this falls under and this is part of what we need to understand when we examine, we scrutinize every spirit 
to see whether it is from God or not from God. We need to understand that the words matter a bit. A bit. We need to look at the life of the person. We need to look at even the the life of a teaching, if you want to put it that way. And what I mean by that is you can trace through recent history, and I'll just deal with recent history, the effects and the, the enduring effects of the idea of the prosperity gospel and things like that. They might use Bible verses as Satan did in the temptation of Jesus in, in, Mark, uh, in Matthew 4 and in Luke 4. They might use scripture. They might use the right words. They might have the right kind of attitude and persona on screen and, um, and in person. And they might do very well in those environments and look to be confessing. They appear to be confessing Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. But their life is not in accordance with what Jesus lived and presented. And that's what it is to confess Jesus, is to have our lives in accordance with what he exemplified and what he taught, right? What Jesus did and taught, as Luke writes in the beginning of Acts. And so we need to be able then to examine, to scrutinize, and have the diligence to scrutinize every doctrine, every teaching, every spirit that we hear, especially associated with the gospel, and see if it's really over the course of its life, the life of an idea. For example, if you look at the idea that God wants you to be wealthy, and he wants you to be rich and prosperous, does that line up with does that represent accurately, to any degree, what Jesus lived and taught? Jesus said that the foxes of the earth have holes, the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He was decidedly poor. Now, and he gives many warnings about being wealthy. He never prohibits it. He never condemns it. And I want to be very clear about that. That that is not the point of any scriptural teaching is to prohibit or to, to make it seem as though wealth is in and of itself a sin. No, it's the love of money. It's the obsession with it. If that's what you are seeking, right, then it's a temptation, right? And it can become a temptation. And if we can't keep it under control, that's a whole nother rabbit trail. But what he does talk about is the is blessed are the poor, right? He says, if you will always have enough. He says, don't worry. Don't be anxious about what you will eat or what you will wear, right? Implying that we're frequently, if we're following him, going to be in need in those areas and not know we might have legitimate physical reasons to be anxious about what we might eat or what we might wear, right? Whether we have enough to get by. He has that expectation. The idea that uh, if you are following Christ, if you are in Christ, then nothing bad will happen to you. The, that God will protect you and keep you safe and free from all harm. Then why does Jesus say at the beginning, the, some of the earliest of his teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, right at the tail end of the Beatitudes, his segue from the Beatitudes into the next segment of the sermon, is, blessed are you when, then, when men persecute you. For my name's sake. Why does he make it so crystal clear to his disciples that men will hate you because of me? Keep it up. Blessed are you and endure that. The disciples later who wrote, the apostles later who wrote about their suffering said, I count it a joy that I'm counted worthy. It's a blessing that I'm counted worthy to suffer as Christ suffered. Right? And Paul calls Timothy to suffer with him as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And so we have this idea, we, we need to examine this teaching, that if God wants everything to be, to be hunky-dory and everything to be fine and smooth sailing and no harm will come to you, then we need to really examine that against Scripture and say, no, that does not confess the same things that Jesus confessed. That does not look like the same thing that Jesus' life looked like. Therefore, it is not from God. We need to have this ability to discern and to examine doctrine carefully um, to discern whether it is from God or whether it is not from God. The end of verse 3 uh, he goes on to say that this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. 
I talked before when the last time he mentioned the Antichrist a couple, um, I think it was a couple chapters ago. I think it's in chapter two that he primarily talks about it, uh, that the Antichrist has come into the world. This is the deceitful spirit. This is the enemy. In 2 John 7, it's everyone who does not confess that Jesus is the Son of God, right? Is as the Antichrist is the spirit of the Antichrist. It's not one singular beast. It is not one singular monstrosity or even one singular historical person or future person or maybe present person, just to cover all of our tenses here who is going to be the Antichrist who will stand against the church and that we'll have to endure, or that we have endured, or whatever, the singular person being the Antichrist. That is not founded in Scripture, brethren. That is not founded in Scripture. He says simply that it is already in the world. It's the spirit of the Antichrist. It's the spirit of denying that Jesus is from the Father. It's the spirit of denying everything that the cross is about and represents. That is the spirit of the Antichrist, and that is what we must be on guard against. And it is already in the world. It was in the world in the first century when John was writing this, and it is still in the world today. There are many who deny. There are many who deny, whether by their words or not, that Jesus is the Son of God. There are many who live in defiance of God and his law and his will. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, Going on from there, he says in verse 4, he comes back to little children. And it, and it, my wife pointed out as we were looking at this um, together, getting ready for this, that we love how often in here he says little children. That's how he regards, he's, he's a grandfather in the faith, and he, he's, he's teaching, he's passing these things on so lovingly and so gently, so firmly and truthfully, but gently and lovingly and sweetly that he's passing these on to his little children. But did you notice, and depending on your translation, in verse 21, and, uh, chapter 3, verse 21, and in chapter 4, verse 1, uh, he switches for a little bit, for just a little bit. In verse 18, 318, it's little children. Then in 321, it's beloved. And in 4, verse 1, it's beloved. And then here in 4, verse 4, it's little children. I just like that. I don't know all, what all to make of that. Um, the Holman Christian standard that I've been looking at from time to time says, dear friends, instead of beloved. Uh, whatever the case is, um, I think it's interesting that he, he appeals to them in different ways and by different names. But at any rate, coming back to verse 4 here. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. What a beautiful, what an altogether important thing for us to know as we go about discerning and testing every spirit, as we go about trying to confess and be those who live out the Word of God in each of our daily lives and make sure that we are complying and exhibiting and breathing out the spirit of truth, not the spirit of error, and who stand against the Antichrist, which even understanding it to not be the big to-do that many have made it out to be, it's still a terrifying thought that this is the enemy and the presence of the enemy and the, the, the size, the great size and scope in the physical realm of our enemy. It's a terrifying thing. So how important, how essential is it that he has laid this groundwork throughout his teaching here in this first letter that John is writing that I'm telling you these things so that you'll be vigilant, you'll be on guard and aware, not so that you'll be afraid. Okay, We have no reason to be afraid of the Antichrist. We should have respect to for the Antichrist and the, the, the power of persuasion that the spirit of error has to take people away from the church of God. But he who is in us, he who is in you, is greater than he who is in the world, is greater than the Antichrist, is greater than Satan himself and all of his hosts and his armies. He, Our God is greater, and that's what and whom we serve. We do very, very well to keep this in our hearts constantly as an abiding truth that he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world, which keeps us humble because it's not by my strength. It's not by my willpower. It's not my, 
by my abilities in any regard that I'm able to overcome sin or to stand against error and for the, and represent the truth well. It's only because God is alive in me. And God is bigger than that. God is bigger. God is greater. God is stronger. That's what I live in and that's what lives in me. They, the Antichrist group, crowd, people who are not confessing Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, they are from the world. Therefore they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So as we wrap up, I want us to think about the idea of why he would stress as he's talking about this, why he would stress at all that those who are of the world are listened to by people who are of the world. And people who are not of God probably won't listen very much to us. Isn't it, has it ever been frustrating for you when you've had maybe a religious argument with somebody or a discussion, you're trying to convince somebody of the truth of the gospel and to turn away from the error that they're walking in? It's very seldom that, that will happen. It's rocky ground. It's it's not good ground for for that to happen, for the seed to fall on. Maybe it's just not good ground right now. Whatever. We don't know. We don't know the reasons for these things. But it is so freeing. And I think this is the point of this. It is so freeing. We still need to be diligent. Present the gospel. This is not an excuse for anything less. But it is freeing to understand and to have preconceived into our minds this, this idea, this understanding, this knowledge, right? That people who are of the world are not going to listen to me. Okay, They are not going to hear what I'm saying and take it to heart in most cases. That is going to be the general way of things because broad is the gate and there are many who enter by it that goes to destruction, right? So I need to understand at the onset that, it, first of all, it's not me that's being rejected. It's God that's being rejected. And it's not the way that I'm presenting it necessarily, though it never hurts to, to critique and to, to make improvements to that process. Um, but it's not about you. It's about whether they're from God or they're not from God. It's about whether they are inclined to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he died for their sins, to humble themselves, to recognize what Jesus has done for them. If they're willing to do that, then your words will be effective, or somebody's will along the way. If they're not, and if they're not ready to hear that right now, then your words won't be the, be effective. There's a an adage, right, about uh, for the right person at the right time, you can't say the wrong thing, and for the wrong person at the wrong time, you can't say the right thing. The idea that people, by virtue of their situation and things going on, are going to be more or less beyond reach. We still have the responsibility of sowing the seed. It might take root later. We don't know. But this the sense of freedom that, that God consistently gives us throughout the New Testament to say, you just worry about doing the work. Don't worry about the results. Don't worry about the metrics. Don't worry about how many people you're, you're baptizing a week or a month or a year. Don't worry about that. You just worry about, you make sure that you are doing what you're supposed to do. Make sure you are confessing Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, proving that you are indeed from God. Because as we looked at last time, we are his children. And that's a beautiful comfort that we have through Scripture. So, we are from God, whoever, uh, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. Uh, we are from God, whoever knows God listens to us, whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Let's all work on making sure that we are not just confessing, not just talking about, not just leaving on, on Facebook posts and other things, things that are generally true. Let's make sure that we are living the truth. Let's make sure that we are embodying it in our very lives so that nobody can look at our lives and the way that we've lived our lives as a whole, as a unit, and say that person was not confessing Christ. Yeah, they were saying these things. Yeah, they were using their mouth in these ways, but their life did not confess Christ. Make sure that your life is confessing Christ. Now, if we're going to do that, uh, by way of wrapping up, by, uh, by way of conclusion and 
invitation of sorts. If we are doing that, if our life truly wants to reflect Christ living in us, then we need to accept him as our Savior by putting him on in baptism. That's what we're told to do in Romans 6 and the Great Commission. That's how we make disciples, by baptizing them um, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's how we come in contact with the blood that washes us clean. That's how we answer to God from a good conscience and receive a good conscience from God. That's how we are raised, once again, in Romans 6, to walk in newness of life, to be a new creature in Him. And on we could go. That's where that culminates. So if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that is wonderful. But James says even the demons believe and they shudder, so it can't stop there. If you are willing to confess and to live a life that is compliant, that is exemplifying what Jesus was about, what Jesus lived, did, and taught, then you need to be willing to repent and turn away from sin and the things that keep you from that goal and to have nothing more to do with them, to put those sins away from you, and to walk in true newness, to walk in what he has prescribed and allowed for us. Uh, Having all of these things then been done, uh, then we need to put him on, be immersed in baptism, in the waters of baptism. Jesus himself said, uh, whoever is born again of water and the Spirit will inherit the eternal kingdom. And so that is then the calling for each of us is to put him on so that we can inherit that eternal reward. Uh, If you'll do that, if you want to message me on Facebook, uh, whether through the church's page or my own personal page, wherever you might find this, if you want to give me a call uh, or send me a text, my number is area code 605-381-1851. Um, if you want to send me an email at trevor.trokey at gmail.com, if you want to reach out to me in any way or another brother or sister in Christ and either confess your sins or confess Jesus as Christ for salvation, repent, turn your life over to him, then we urge you to do so very strongly. And don't let another minute go by because we don't know whether we have another minute or not. For those of us who are in Christ, make sure that your life truly is confessing that uh, the one whose name we wear Um, and so if you need help with that or encouragement with that if you'd like to study something or or make improvements in any way that i could be helpful or of use to you uh, reach out to me reach out to another brother so that we can bear one another's burdens and help each other on the road to heaven i love you all very much